From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Loretta Young and George Brent in The Girl from 10th Avenue. Lux presents Hollywood. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Lux Radio Theater. The theater made possible by your loyal purchases of those fine products, Lux Toilet Soap and Lux Flakes. Tonight, Loretta Young and George Brent bring you a play of strange romance, a drama of clashing environments, the love story of a girl who lived on the wrong side of the tracks and of a man whose wealth and social position stood between them. As special guest, our program also features Mrs. Emily Post, the most famous authority in the world on etiquette. Louis Silvers conducts our orchestra. And now, your host, the producer of the Lux Radio Theater. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Three years ago when I made the Crusades, Loretta Young was starred as Baron Garrier, not the ocean liner. But Baron Garrier, wife of Richard the Lionheart, the only queen of England who never set foot on English soil. When the day to start the film arrived... There was no Miss Young. Marooned by a blizzard on the 14,000-foot heights of Mount Rainier, where she was making the call of the wild, her Hollywood arrival was delayed for weeks. I had hundreds of players on salary, so was forced to proceed without her and made the giant battle scenes. When Loretta finally arrived, I started back at the beginning of the picture. But unfortunately for me, the warfare had been so realistic that nearly all the players' costumes were ruined, so tattered and torn that uh, not even Lux Flakes could restore them. <clears throat> and the call of the wild was a lullaby compared to the howl I made when I learned what Miss Young had unintentionally cost me. But all's well tonight, as she becomes Miriam Brady and the girl from 10th Avenue. Born on a street called Hollywood in Salt Lake City, Loretta has spent most of her life in the town called Hollywood. Her new picture at 20th Century Fox is Four Men and a Prayer. George Brent, who plays Jeffrey Sherwood, is one of Hollywood's most valued importations from Ireland. George left the University of Dublin to join the famous Abbey Players. Since then, he's been a diamond miner, a stoker, a sheep herder, a blacksmith, and an actor on Broadway, with another youngster then destined for stardom. Clark Gable. Now a Warner Brothers star, Mr. Brent has reached new heights in his two latest films, Gold is Where You Find It and Jezebel. Featured in our cast tonight are Beulah Bondi, one of the screen's finest character actresses, as Mrs. Martin, Mona Barry as Valentine, and Eric Snowden as John Marland. And now, the Lux Radio Theater presents Loretta Young and George Brent and the girl from 10th Avenue. An invitation has been issued to the socially prominent of New York City. It reads, Mr. and Mrs. Martin French request the honor of your presence at the marriage of their daughter, Valentine. To Mr. John Marland at high noon, Tuesday, the 5th of April, at St. Thomas Church. Get in line. Let me look at you, Valentine. No, oh, you make a lovely bride, my dear. Thank you, Father. I'll second that motion. So will I. You tell me. You. How are you, Val? Well, what are you two doing back here? We're going to start in a minute. We minutes. wouldn't miss a word of it. Best wishes, Val, and a lot of happiness. John Marlon's a lucky guy. Oh, thank you, Tony. By the way, where's Jeffrey? I haven't seen him yet. Well, um, Jeffrey's not coming. Not coming? Why not? Well, that's a long story. It begins way back in 1804. Shut up. He can't come, Val. Uh, he, well, he has a pretty important case in court. In fact, it's the biggest case he's ever handled. Oh, I see. Of course, that's much more important than my wedding. We're ready, dear. Oh, I'm coming, Father. You can start any time you want now. <laughs> 
I think Miss French is sore about something. Yeah, wouldn't she just love to have Jeff here? Then she could twist that knife she put in his back. Well, he isn't the first guy to get jilted. Hmm. Did you try to reach him? Uh, I've been trying for a week. His butler doesn't know where he is. His office hasn't seen him for a month. <laughs> He's on a case, all right. Bottle number 12. Open the door. Keep back there. Keep back there now and don't push. Hey, you. Now, where do you think you're going? Uh, Daily Press, officer. I want to get a close-up of the happy bride and groom coming out of the church door. All right, okay, okay. Go on. Now, the rest of you, I want you to keep back. Excuse me. One side, please. Oh! Hey, you, who do you think you're shoving? You stepped right on my foot. Oh, I beg your pardon. I hope you'll forgive my awkwardness. Huh? Oh. Oh, okay. Thank you. Gee, it's swell wedding, ain't it? Oh, I wished I was inside so I could see it. You do, huh? Uh-huh. Want to hear what they're saying, huh? Well, sure. Well, I'll tell you. Two people are in there making important promises to each other and trying not to laugh. Valentine, do you take this social register parasite to be a lawful wedded toy, to hate, dishonor, and ignore since it brings material advantages, both social and financial? I do, I do, I do. <laughs> Say, listen, mister, you better pipe down. Everybody's looking. Get up! And I pronounce you man and wife and a cockeyed credit of the country. Here comes the bride. Boom, boom, de boom. Oh, why don't you get out of here? You're only going to get yourself in a jam. They'll run you in there. Well, let them. Let them. Let them book me in a charge. Disorderly conduct. Name, please? Jeffrey Sherwood, Your Honor. Jeffrey Sherwood, the second, the third, the fourth, Jeffrey the fifth. Jeffrey Sherwood? Well, just call me Jeff. Jeff the Jilter, that's me. Say, listen, Mr. Sherwood, there's a reporter over there. They'll take a couple of nice pictures of you like this, and then they'll ship you off to Bellevue. Huh? Yeah. Oh, am I being conspicuous? Well, a little. You better skid around the corner. Very well. Come on, young lady. Never mind about me. You go along by yourself. Oh, ditched again. Huh? All right, then. I'll go with you. Come on. Boom de boom, boom boom de boom. Hey, haven't you boomed about enough of that? Oh, 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 do you mind? Looking like a darn fool? Yes, I do. Well, did the lady walking up the center aisle of that church look like a darn fool? Why should she? Exactly. She paraded up the center aisle with a man she didn't love. Now you're parading with a man you don't love. <laughs> Very funny. Yeah, I'm doubled over. Yeah. Come on. Well, where are we going now? We're going to get you something to eat. I suppose you remember how to eat. Uh-huh, vaguely, yeah. French fries on the side. Well, how do you feel now? I feel thirsty. Waiter. Yeah, uh huh. One quart of champagne and two glasses. Champagne? Say, where do you think you are, buddy? We ain't got that stuff. All right, all right. Send out and get it. No, huh? oh, waiter, waiter, forget it, will you? Listen, Mr. Sherwood, I'm not celebrating with you. Why not? I'm going to drop you at a Turkish bath. You need to steam and sleep. Fine, so I can wake up around midnight and think. Oh, you got to snap out of it sometime. Sure, I'm going to snap out of it right now. You and I are going places, man. Well, I am. I'm going to work. Work? Believe it or not, I do. This is my lunch hour. You're using it up. Say, I think I'll let you buy my lunch. Oh, you're a model, huh? Don't be funny. I sew on labels at $3 a day. Well, you need a vacation. I'll get plenty starting Saturday. They're laying a bunch of us off then. All right, starting right now, you're showing labels on me until Saturday. Here, hey, wait a minute. Hey, here's a hundred dollars for a beginner, and there's plenty more where that came from. I was waiting for something like that. Well, you can keep your money, Mr. Sherwood, and I'll buy my own lunch. Here, yeah, here, yeah, now, wait a minute, please. Please, I didn't mean anything by it. I, now, please, sit down. I, I just thought I could help you, that's all. Well, you don't need to. I'm pretty good at taking care of myself. Well, I wish you'd pass the secret along to me. <laughs> you could use it all right. Say, how could you let a girl get you down like this anyway? I only know it can be done. Yeah. But you'll stick with me, won't you? You see? See, I don't want to be alone for a while anyway. Okay. I'll stick. Good girl. Hello? Hello, is this Bryant 70643? Well, I want to speak to a Mr. Hugh Williams. Oh. Oh, well, Mr. Williams, you're a friend of Mr. Jeffrey Sherwood's, ain't you? Yeah. Yeah, I found your number in a little book he was carrying. I just want to tell you that he's all right. Yeah, yeah, he's fine. I've been with him all day. What? Oh, no, 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 you don't know me. My name's Brady, Miriam Brady. 
Say, is there any special place you'd like him delivered? Oh, well, wait a minute. What's that number? Oh, yeah, okay, I got it. I'll try to get in there, only only right now he's kind of set on hitting all the night spots. Yeah. Hey, I've got to hang up now. He's coming this way. Goodbye. <laughs> Circus, the Black Cat, the Half Moon Club, and the Hotsy Totsy Club. Four more and we'll set a record. One more and I'm taking you home. Ah, uh, deserter, eh? You can't take it, oh, huh? sure I can, but Come don't on, you honey. see it's... A... Hello, Jeff. What? Say, listen. I'm your old friend Hugh, remember? And uh, this is Tony. We all used to go to school together. Evening, Jeffrey. What a nice, depressing sight you are. Go away. Is that a nice way to treat the head of the fourth form? We're going to join the party. Uh, how'd you find me? Oh, that was easy. We just went into every nightclub in New York, and there you were. Well, I guess you don't need me any longer, so I'll beat it. No, 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 you don't. Sit down. This is, uh, this is Miss... Uh... Now, how do you do? Hello. Well, what do you say, Jeff? Let's get out of here. What do you mean, let's get out of here? We're going home. Home? Oh, no. Oh, yes. Get a grip on him, Tony. Right. Yeah, hey, hey, let, let go, go, let go. Yeah. All right, hey, now watch yourself, boys. Oh, I haven't been in a fight in the rest of since I cleaned out that place in, the, in New oh, Haven. Oh, it's no good, Hugh. You can't move oh, him. Oh, all right. Let him go. Thanks. Hello, boys. Now, hi, Jeff. Sit down. Now, we'll all sit down. Not me. I got to get going. Oh, no. Where you go, I go. Uh, Jeff, do you mind if I speak to the lady for a while? Uh, how long a while? Oh, just for a minute. Will you come out here, miss? I'll bring her right back, you hear? Oh, sure, sure. Come over here, please. Well... I suppose you're the girl who called me earlier this evening. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I've been with him since around lunchtime. He's okay if you humor him a little. Uh, you seem to be pretty successful at that. Well, I guess I... Say, what's that supposed to mean? Nothing. Where'd you meet him? Outside of a church, and if you think it's been any picnic, you're crazy. You know, you can do me a big favor by taking him off my hands right now. <laughs> I guess you mean it all right. I'm sorry. You better keep out of crowds till you can size people up right. I said I was sorry. Okay. I'll just sneak out. You'll be able to handle him all right if you take it easy. I don't know. I'm afraid if we try, he'll tear the place down. I'll tell you what we'll do. You take care of him alone. If you deliver him safe and sound to that address I gave you, well, we'll make it all right with you. Now, look, mister. I don't want anything. But he has got a big role. You better get it off him. I, uh, I'm afraid I can't. But I'm glad you mentioned it. Anyhow, you know. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, miss, uh, what was it? Brady. I live at 234 East 16th. It's a sort of a working girls club. Ring them up if you want. Gramercy 28249. <laughs> I don't think that'll be necessary. We'll take a chance on you, Miss Brady. I'll take care of him. Well, what do you say now? Ain't it about time he was leaving? Now, why don't you stop? You're getting to talk like my friends. Oh, <laughs> I was only thinking of you, mister. I'm having a grand time. That's the girl. Gee, I never expected to find myself in a joint like this. You've been mighty sweet, Miriam, <laughs> keeping me from going crazy all day. Oh, that's all right, Jeff. I, uh, I can call you Jeff, can I? Sure. <laughs> what time is it? Oh, now, please. Yeah, the boat left the dock a half an hour ago. They're on it now. Valentine French and John... Oh, look, let's dance, huh? What do you say? She's alone with him. Oh, don't, will you? You've been getting along swell up until now. Now, don't go to pieces. Oh, I, I can't help... Well, it. come on, we're having fun. Now, don't leave me. I can't be alone. I'm not going to leave you. I'm sticking. Look here, I got my arm around you. Right around you in a public place, too. Oh, you're just like a poor little kid that wants to be petted, ain't you? Well, let's get out of here. Let's hit those other four places. Let's hit them all. Sure, okay, come and Don't on. let me down, will you? Don't. Don't let me down, Miriam. I won't. Not for a minute. Hello. Hello. Good morning, sir. Desk clerk. Yeah, well, uh, what I want to know is what desk clerk? Where am I? You're in the Lakewood Hotel, sir. Well, that's very interesting. I don't suppose you could tell me how I got here, could you? Yes, sir. You came late last night. Your wife brought you, sir. My wife? Did you say my wife? Uh, yes, sir. She brought you about three... Good morning. Uh, come in, please. Uh -huh. Come over here. What happened last night? Did I marry you? Yes. Oh, the end of a perfect day. Oh, I tried to talk you out of it. Honest, I did. But you kept insisting, and, well, I... I, I guess I was sort of crazy last night, too. Well, that's fine. Oh, I'm sorry. But you'll find the marriage license on the dresser, and, and there's a note I wrote to you this morning. Note? 
Yeah, it, it just says that last night when you married me, you didn't know what you was doing, and so I give up all claims to you. Gee, you're a lawyer. You can get an annulment, can't you? Yeah, I guess so. And and your money's under the pillow. We didn't blow so much. I let you hand the court clerk $25 because you got him up at 2 in the morning. You wanted to give him 100 And the taxi driver got 10 for being a witness, and the taxi bill was sixteen fifty. and... Oh, well, here, here, you better count. Yeah, well, let's avoid mathematics for a while, shall we? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Sherwood. And uh, if you'll study our marriage license, you'll discover that my first name is Jeffrey. Oh, well... I, I brought you some orange juice. Here, you better drink it. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> well, you've certainly been taking excellent care of me, Miriam. Well, you needn't rub it in. Get rid of me any way you like. I don't want anything. Here, I don't even want this thing. Did I buy you a wedding ring? Yeah, from the court clerk. He keeps them for suckers like you. Oh. Well, would you mind saving it? It's valuable as evidence. No, I don't want any hold on you. Well, then why did you go to all the trouble of marrying me? I told you I was crazy. I felt sorry for you. Yeah, I'm beginning to remember. Gee, you were getting awful, brooding about those two on the boat. You said only I could keep it off your mind. And you kept begging me to stick to you, and, well, I, I got the dumb idea that you really needed me. So when you asked me to marry you, it sounded swell. And when we got here, you... you fell asleep, crying in my arms. Well, I guess all I can say is that I'm sorry. Why, you probably kept me out of the river last night. Not that it makes much difference. Well, you don't have to talk like that. This will all be washed up in a few weeks. You'll have forgotten her, and, and me too. I won't bother you. You better go back to New York where your friends can look after you. You go if you like. I'll be quite comfortable here. Oh, I get it. You want to stay here alone so you can carry on the way you did yesterday. Oh, right? I'd be delighted to yeah. have you with me, but, but you'd be better off not. Uh, the day after tomorrow, you call on Mr. Howard Case, New York City Bank. He'll have something for you. I told you I didn't want anything. This is the first time I've seen you as yourself, Mr. Sherwood, and now I can tell you. You can't take it. I'm afraid I can't, so why bother? Oh, no, I didn't mean that. Y your nerves are all shot, or you'd see it different. Get yourself into some kind of shape, and you'll realize you never really loved that Valentine Dane. Right, now, take why, it easy. listen, you were crying on my shoulder last night, but you didn't know what you were crying about, and that's straight. Well, you didn't know what you were crying for. You'd forgotten her. So what? Well, keep on crying if it makes you feel better. You'll come out of it. Cry all you want to. On your shoulder? <laughs> sure, if you like. Oh, I'll stay with you till, till you get normal again. Well, <laughs> what makes you think I ever want to be normal again? Well, you can give yourself a chance, can't you? Listen, listen, I'll tell you what. Let's get on a bus or something and, and go up to the Adirondacks. Oh, gee, it'd be swell up there now. We could get a cabin somewhere. Maybe on a lake. We could cook our own meals and I wouldn't bother you. And in a few weeks, you'd be a new man. And then what? Well, then goodbye, same as here. Oh, I couldn't do that. But why not? Well, because it isn't fair to you. Well, don't worry about me. Tell me honestly. Huh? Do you like me? Well, I suppose I like you a little, or I, I wouldn't want to help you. Well, you're my wife, remember? Yeah. For a while, anyway. I'll stay with you while you need me, and, and then we quit. Friends. All right, I'll do it. <laughs> and I think it's pretty swell of you, too. <laughs> And you won't regret it, Miriam. No, I won't. I'm sure I won't. And so ends the first act of tonight's production, The Girl from 10th Avenue, starring Loretta Young and George Brent. Before they return in the second act, we would like to bring you, in our brief intermission, a few excerpts from a unique kind of diary a musical diary kept by a young lady named Jean, who is in love with a young man named Bill Brown. The diary opens with Jean tired at the end of a long day at the office. It's almost time to go home. I'm tired, but I don't want to go to bed. I've been typing, filing, slaving all day long, and I'm really just about dead. But Bill is coming up tonight. Lucky I know what to do. A Lux toilet soap bath will set me right, make me feel as good as new. An hour or so has elapsed, and Jean sings another song as she dresses after her bath, getting ready to go out with Bill. Hi ho, hi ho, it sure is good to know. You're fresh and sweet from head to toe. Hi ho, hi ho, hi ho, hi ho, hi ho. With Lux, it's just a snap. My 
luck so fast beats the beauty nap. Hi ho, hi ho. Jean is singing the last song after she's returned from her date with Bill and is getting ready to go to bed. I clean my face so thoroughly. No cosmetic skin for me. I use Lux toilet soap and then put out the lights and go to sleep. Active lather always scores. No danger then of choking pores. I use Lux toilet soap and then put out the lights and go to sleep. Bill asked me to be Mrs. Brown. He said he thought I was perfection. I laughed but did not turn him down. I owe my thanks to my complexion, so Mrs. Brown will also be careful of her skin, and she will use Lux toilet soap and then put out the lights and go to sleep. Well, you've all guessed by this time that Jean is one of those clever girls who follow the lead of nine out of ten Hollywood stars. These smart girls use Lux toilet soap to protect their complexion to guard against the choked pores that cause dullness, tiny blemishes, enlarged pores, cosmetic skin. They use this fine complexion soap as a bath soap, too, because its active lather ensures daintiness, leaves skin really fresh, delicately fragrant. Our producer, Mr. DeMille. We continue with The Girl from 10th Avenue, starring Loretta Young and George Brent, with Beulah Bundy and Mona Barry. Two months have passed, and under Miriam's watchful eye, Jeffrey has settled down to a normal existence. And yet there's been no mention of divorce. And for the girl from 10th Avenue, the days rush by in waves of hope and happiness. In their modest apartment in lower New York, Jeffrey is working late at his desk. The door opens, and Miriam enters quietly. Jeff. Hmm? Oh, come in. Jeff. I, I didn't want to disturb you, but there's somebody here to see you. Who? Two friends of yours. I think they said Tony and Hugh. They've been looking for you. Oh, yes. I've been expecting them to show up. Why didn't you tell them I wasn't here? Well, what good would that have done? You can't go on hiding from your friends forever. The only way is to go out and meet them and, and keep quiet about me. I don't care what they think. Well, I don't, Miriam. For your sake as well as my own. Well, you better talk it over with them anyway. I'll go downstairs and return some books I borrowed from Mrs. Martin. All right. You can call me up when they've gone. Come in. Good evening, Miss Martin. Well, hello, darling. <laughs> Miss Martin, I was wondering, uh, can I visit with you while Jeffrey sees his friend? May you? Oh, <laughs> of course you may. <laughs> That's right, may I. I always forget. Sit down, Miriam. Thanks. Oh, and I, uh, I brought the check for the rent, too. Oh, there wasn't any hurry about that. And, and here's some books you lent me. Gee, they were swell. Well, Oh, I mean splendid. <laughs> <laughs> That's better, dear. Much better. Ah, you are sweet, Mrs. Martin. Lending me books and watching my speech for me. Gee, it can't be much fun for you. Oh, I'll have my fun, all right. I'll have it the day that husband of yours wakes up and realizes that he can take you anywhere without diluting that blue blood of his. <laughs> I guess that'll be never. It'll be sooner than you think. You're very pretty, Miriam. And you can wear clothes. That's one thing I learned in the theater. Clothes. I'll never forget that little third act ensemble I wore in the last show. It was a green, uh, or was it blue? Well, anyway, it had a little, um... Miriam. Miriam, dear. Hmm? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. What'd you say? What's the matter? Oh. Oh, I, I was just thinking... Here I am, 10th Avenue, trying to learn how to be Park. I wonder if you can do it. I wonder if anyone can learn how to be a lady. Of course you can, dear, if you think it's important enough. Oh, it is. It's very important to be like him, like his friends up there now. And Oh, I, I wonder what they're saying. I wouldn't worry about that, my dear. You away, got me on my feet, and, well, here I am. That's the whole fantastic story. Oh, it's fantastic, all right. So what happens now? Oh, I suppose we'll go on as we are for a while. Falling for her? Oh, my falling days are over. But she's amusing. She keeps my feet on the ground. I suppose I'd be under the daisies by now if it weren't for her. Huh. Gratitude. Maybe. But I want to keep her happy while I can. Oh, it's only a matter of time and you'll be sick of the sight of her. Then she let me go without making any trouble. 
Because I'll see that she never wants for anything. That's very touching. Oh, Jeff, why don't you use your head? You can't lead this kind of a life indefinitely, avoiding your friends, giving up everything that ever meant a darn to you. By the way, what about the firm? Do they know? <laughs> They'd be enchanted with this setup. Uh, especially as my chief drag with them was my social connections. Well, I've resigned. No. My last act of bravado before I became a good citizen. Resigned. Well, why not? What's a little thing like a future? Oh, I'm in oil right now. Uh-huh. I'm the New York representative for a couple of new gushers. A substantial bunch of money seems to be eminent. And just to prove to you boys that I'm not avoiding you, you'll find my office address on this card. Thanks. I imagine this might interest Valentine. I doubt it. I uh, suppose you know she's back from Europe. No, I didn't. Oh, she rings up every day to ask if you've been heard from. Why? Anxious, I suppose. Oh, is she? Well, maybe you'd better relieve her mind. You can get those letters off this afternoon, Miss Mansfield. Yes, sir. Well, Miriam, you won't step out to lunch with me? Nope. I think a man's business hours should be his business hours, and his wife shouldn't butt in. Uh, intrude. Yes, I know, but once <laughs> she brings his rubbers downtown because it looks like rain, I think she writes her lunch. Do you really? Mm-hmm. All right, where should we go? The Waldorf or the Ritz? Well, I uh, haven't got much time, Miriam. I, oh. uh, or I'd take you up on it. Oh, that. don't worry, Jeff. I was only kidding. Make it Belmont Parks on Saturday, huh? And watch me knock him over. <laughs> All right. Next Saturday, today. Just watch me strut across that lawn. Well, who was that ravishing brunette with Sherwood? <laughs> well, I never saw her before, but I do admire him as taste in women. Oh, rather. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Miss Mansfield. Mrs. Marlin to see you, sir. Mrs. Oh. <clears throat> I'll uh, see her in just a moment. Yes, sir. I, uh, I read in the paper where she got back from Europe. Well, I'll be going. Oh, that's not necessary. Why, well, she's here to see you. You don't want to put me on exhibition. Ah, oh, Miriam, don't talk like oh, that. I didn't mean to crack. I, I just meant if I'm not here, it'll be more comfortable all around. I'll go out through the other office. Goodbye, Jeff. Yes, Mr. Sherwood? Show Mrs. Marland in. Yes, sir. Come in, Valentine. How are you, Jeff? Surprised to see me? Yes. Well, I knew we were bound to meet somewhere sooner or later. I thought it best to do it this way. I don't see why we're bound to meet. Well, we have so many mutual friends. I never see them now. Did you drop them all? Most of them, completely. Oh, I'm sorry. They were so fond of you. I, um, uh, I heard of your marriage. Is that why you dropped us? Not altogether, although my wife isn't a society girl. No, so I heard. But there's no reason why you shouldn't see us. It's a pity to lose one's friends. Valentine, I wish you hadn't come here. It's no satisfaction to either of us to meet like this. You're very practical. Well, so are you when you married Marland. You're bitter, aren't you, Jeff? I... I don't suppose it would do any good to tell you I, I've been unhappy, too. I made a mistake, Jeff. A, a horrible mistake. Oh, do you want my sympathy? No. No, I... I want your friendship. Is that so much to ask after what we were to each other? No, oh, I can't help you. You've gone out of my world. You're Marland's wife now. And after what we've been to each other, I'm certainly not going to sink to being your confidant. I wish you hadn't come here. Well, you've told me that already, Jeffrey. Well, it's time I was getting home anyway. Goodbye, Jeff. And if ever you think you could forgive me, you, you know where to find me, Jeff. Hello? Is Mrs. Jeffrey Sherwood there, please? This is Mrs. Sherwood speaking. Mrs. Sherwood, this is John Marland. I'd like very much to have a talk with you. It's rather important. Why, well, why, yes, of course. Will you meet me at the Municipal Art Galleries this afternoon at 2 o'clock? 2 o'clock? Uh, yes, yes, I'll be there, Mr. Marland. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Marland. I didn't know that you and your wife were separated. But I don't see We've how We've been living apart for a month. That's why I wanted to see you. Oh. Well, Jeffrey has nothing to do with it, if that's what you're getting at. Not a thing. Not deliberately, no. But indirectly, yes. How do you get that way? Mrs. Sherwood, I'm not looked upon as particularly brilliant, but I happen to know that Valentine is after your husband. <laughs> now, listen, Mr. Marlin. Nothing gets by me. I know Jeff's only seen her once since you married her. She came to his office once about three months ago. Now, I don't know what Jeff told her, but I can guess. Because she's never come back. You don't know Valentine. Jeffrey's quick recovery was a harsh disappointment. And he means to stay recovered. 
Why, what do you suppose he stays away from all the places that he and she used to go to for? On account of me? Don't be silly. I begged him to go without me. But he won't. It's so he won't meet her. Oh, he's on to her, all right. Is he? Yes. Do you ever read the scandal column, Mrs. Sherwood? Well, sure, sometimes. Well, you must have missed this. Read it, please. Why is a certain young social registrar who belongs to America's swankiest country clubs playing around the municipal golf links and with whom? Your husband has taken to playing on the municipal links, hasn't he? Well, if, if Jeff had met her, he, he'd have told me. She's only been at it for a week. Give her time. Well, there's nothing I can do about it. It's entirely up to you, Mrs. Sherwood. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd let her have him if I, if I thought he'd be happy. He wouldn't be. Any more than I've been. But somehow, I can't bear the thought of losing her. I know how it is. Well, good luck. Thanks. Want some more coffee, Jeff? No, thanks. You're very quiet this evening. Tired? Yeah, a little. You haven't said much yourself. Did you play golf today? Yes. Oh. What did you do? Oh, I... Uh, I went to see an art exhibition. <laughs> My, you're getting to be quite a highbrow, aren't you? Yes. Uh, Jeff. Yeah? Did you know that Valentine and John Marlin have separated? Why, uh, yes, I did hear something about it. You've been seeing her, haven't you, Jeff? Yes, as a matter of fact, I happened to run into her on the golf course the other day. She told me all about herself and Marlon. Oh. It's almost out of her mind. You know, she had to talk to someone. Yeah, and you were that someone. Well, why not? After all, I'm one of Valentine's oldest friends. Well, she certainly treated you like one. Now, look here, let's not get onto a dangerous subject. Oh, you're right. Your friends are none of my business. But when it comes to that woman, I can't take it. Now, listen, Miriam, you and I might as well understand each other right now. Yeah? I'm going to call on Valentine tonight. She's pretty much alone in this row with Marlon. She's asked me for advice and... Well, the least I can do is give her what little help I can. But her husband loves her, Jeff. Hmm, perhaps. Do you? Now, Miriam, up until now, we've kept away from this subject very nicely. But she's no good. She's a heel. Why, what does she do to you? She left you in the gutter, and because I picked you up and made a man out of you, she can't bear to keep her hands off of you. Why, she's nothing but a good dirty... Good night, Miriam. Jeff. Jeff, wait a minute. Jeff, come back, please. Yes, Miriam? Oh, Jeff, I'm sorry. Really, I am. I... It's all right, Miriam. Oh, I'm so sorry. Hello? Hello, is this Mrs. Marlin's house? Yes, this is the Marlin residence. Well, I'd like to speak to Mrs. Marlin, please. Who is calling, please? This is... This is Mrs. Jeffrey Sherwood. Now, one moment, please. Hello, dear. Oh, come in, Mrs. Martin. I'm calling that woman. She'd been trying to see Jeff. My dear, you... Hello? Uh, wait a minute. Yes? I'm sorry, madam, but Mrs. Marlin can't talk to you. Oh, I get it. You mean she won't, huh? All right, then you can tell her this for me, that if she doesn't... Give me that phone. You mustn't do that, Miriam. She'd only tell Jeff you were annoying oh, her. Oh, I'll annoy her, all right. I'm going out to her house, and I'm going to see her. You'll never get any place that way, Miriam. But she's running after Jeff. He'd have kept out of her way, and now she's running after him. But I'll stop that, Mrs. Marlin, if it kills me. If you let yourself go haywire now, Miriam, you'll spoil everything. I can't help it. I'm nearly crazy. Jeff's going to see her. She asked him to. Very well. You want to frighten her off, but you can't do it. Making a scene outside of her house. And that's just as far as you'd get. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. She'd love to throw it up to Jeff that I, he married a gutter snipe. <laughs> All right, I'm learning. I've learned a lot, thanks to you. I can walk into the Waldorf and conduct myself like a lady just as good as she can. The Waldorf? Yeah, and why not? I'll give that dame a shock. Did you see tonight's papers? Oh, this is good. Wait a minute. What are you up well, to? Well, where did I find something? I saw it a while ago. She's given a luncheon at the Waldorf for about ten of her lady friends. Some swell club or something. Here it is. And it's tomorrow. Miriam, you won't make a scene there, I hope. See, nothing. Why, I'm going in there and get a table right next to hers. And I'm going to have a bellhop paging Mrs. Jeffrey Sherwood until it makes her ears ache. And maybe when she gets an eye full of Mrs. Jeffrey Sherwood, she'll come to realize I'll show up better in a divorce scandal than she expects. As a matter of fact, Mrs. Martin, when she and her friends are good and interested, I might go over and introduce myself. Oh, good heavens. You better come along, darling, and see the show. <laughs> oh, my dear, I wouldn't miss it for the world. Pause for 
for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Loretta Young, George Brent, and our all-star cast have concluded the second act of The Girl from Tenth Avenue. They presently return in Act Three. Our play presents a conflict between two social classes. A girl of humble circumstances suddenly thrust into the realm of fashionable society. Just as first impressions are vitally important in our play tonight, so are they important in real life. For both business and social success depend to a large extent on good first impressions. Impressions which correct manners often make for their absence mar. And so, a special guest, we bring you the country's most famous authority on manners and etiquette. A woman who appreciates not only the little niceties, but who realizes that true breeding uh, means more on the, the, to the... Uh, kind of human being you really are than upon any of the rules of good social behavior. And that perhaps explains why Emily Post is such a great personality. For a quarter of a century, one of Manhattan's charming hostesses, she's also a prolific author. Her books are used not only in thousands of homes and offices, but also in the movies as handbooks of correct usage and as the last arbiter in matters of deportment. And so, speaking to you from New York City, as the guest of the Lux Radio Theater, Mrs. Emily Post. The play tonight has been most interesting so far because the girl Miriam, although she's very crude, has qualities that really count. The ordinary girl in her place would be thinking of surface appearance only. Her thoughts would be centered on herself. All the time she'd be thinking, how do I look? What impression am I making? This type of person is defeated at the beginning. But behind Jeffrey's drinking, his weakness of character, Miriam has little by little become aware of the fineness that is another side of him, a fineness she's never hitherto encountered. And through this gradual discovery of quality in him, she's now conscious of her own shortcomings. Her deepening love for him is impelling her not only to make him the man he's capable of being, but into her own heart comes a longing to bridge the wide difference between her own lack of social advantages and those which have always been his. The question is, can she do this? I'm very anxious to hear the rest of the play to see how the problem is solved. Because in generations past, a girl in such a situation in real life would have found herself facing an absolutely insurmountable barrier. But today, it's what you are, what you yourself have done, and all the greater credit to you who have gone far by your own effort. In the play, Miriam has made an almost superhuman effort to understand the mind and heart and point of view of this man she loves. And every effort she puts forth can be likened to a shoot sent upward by a growing plant whose roots at the same time go down deeper and deeper into the earth. If she were content to learn a smattering of the nearly surface rules of etiquette, but to feel nothing of the motives beneath them, if she were thinking only of outward appearance, she would never be able to achieve success or the awareness of true value, which is always a hallmark of a person of quality. Well, Mrs. Post, that is very encouraging indeed. But I wonder if you would give us just a few details of the most common faults in etiquette. If you mean rudeness, there are two. The great American rudeness is the discourtesy of the hostess who serves herself first. After all, the dish of honor has been prepared for the guest of honor and not for the hostess to gouge a hole out of it herself. And the little American rudeness is putting missus before your signature at the end of a letter. This is the same as saying, my social position is higher than yours. Thank you, Mrs. Post. Thank you. 
I love being on this program. You know, I always listen to it. And you know, Mr. DeMille, Lux has been in daily use in my own house for many, many years. We're grateful, Mrs. Post, for your contributions to more gracious living. We're back now in Hollywood and about to hear Loretta Young, George Brent, Beulah Bondi, and Mona Barry in The Girl from 10th Avenue. It's the following afternoon. Determined to show herself off to Valentine Marland, Miriam has ordered a table in the Waldorf dining room, a table just across the aisle from Valentine's luncheon party. The girl from 10th Avenue is very much the lady as she makes her entrance with Mrs. Martin. Two, madame. Yes, two, please. We've ordered a table. Mrs. Jeffrey Sherwood is the name. Yes, madame. This way, please. Head way up, darling, and walk slowly. How's this? Splendid. <laughs> hey, there she is. Don't nudge, darling. Where? There. Right over there near the palms. See her? She's the one with the awful hat. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I see her. Oh, oh, I guess this is the table you ordered, huh? But it's behind her. I ought to be facing her. All the better. Tell the waiter it won't do. Oh. And be sure she hears you. Ah. Raise your voice, but just enough. <laughs> and watch your grammar. A couple of them are looking at us now. What an entrance. <laughs> Halfway across the room. Why, Mrs. Martin, there's a man who wants to bow to you. Where? Oh, oh, just a Belmont tout. Ritz him. Right here, madame. Go ahead, darling. Here? You mean this is the table? Yes, madame. Oh, but I've no intention of sitting behind this pillar. I said I wanted a very good table. But, madame, I, I telephoned this morning. Mrs. Jeffrey Sherwood. I'm sorry, Mrs. Sherwood. Perhaps if I could move the table. Yes, do, please, by all means. Put it on the other side of this party. There seems to be room. At once, madame. Emil, Jack, move the table for Mrs. Sherwood. Thank you very much. Not at all, Mrs. Sherwood. <laughs> there. Will you be seated? Emil, a menu. Any luck yet? I don't know. She glanced over here once. Oh, she's looking now. Quick. Wave at uh, someone across the room. Uh, uh, hello? Hello? Oh. Oh. What's the matter? Miriam. What? What? Oh, you would pick an acquitted murderess. Oh. Um. Oh. Well, dear. Never mind. Just make conversation and get your name into yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Well, don't worry about that. Well, <laughs> here we go. Oh, it was very amusing, Mrs. Mark. <laughs> was it, my dear? <laughs> yes, you see, we met on Fifth Avenue just the other day, and he said to me, Why, Mrs. Sherwood, how do you do? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my dear, then he knew you were married. Of course, darling. Why else would he have called me Mrs. Sherwood? <laughs> <laughs> she got it that time. Valentine? Mm. Yes, she's looking over this way. Yeah, I see her. And now that I'm getting a good look at her, she's not so hot. Oh, mind your expressions, darling. We'll just sit here quietly and uh, give her a very bad half hour. Uh, she's impressed, all right. She knows now she's not taking on any tramp. Oh, darling, you're under a terrific strain, so do confine yourself solely to pantomime. I'd love to suck her on that stuck-up nose of hers. Look at her giving me the dagger eye. <laughs> what a washout that one is. Stop glaring at her like that. I can't help it when I think of Jeff going to see her. You're to frighten her off by appearing superior to it all. Isn't that the idea? Well, I'm not feeling like well, that. Well, you must feel it to look it. You must submerge yourself in the pot. Now, wow. remember, you're a lady well-bred and refined. Yes, I'll remember. And since I've listened to those dames chatter, I think I can mix in all right. Oh, oh no, no, you could Listen, I can crack back at anything she could say to me. I'm going over and introduce myself. Oh, Miriam, for heaven's sake, don't make a scene. Now, listen, I can be just as Park Avenue as the rest of them. Well, my husband has dieted and exercised until it's pathetic, but it hasn't made the slightest effect, so of course it must be glandular. <laughs> How do you do, Mrs. Marland? Oh, I beg your pardon. I, I don't think we've met. No, we haven't. I'm introducing myself. I'm Mrs. Jeffrey Sherwood. Oh, are you really? I thought since you and Jeff were such good friends, we ought to know each other. Indeed. Yes. Well, perhaps you are not aware this is a private party, oh, Mrs. Sherwood. I think it's delightful. Way to bring me a chair, will you? Will you go away, please? Here you are, madam. Thank you. <laughs> this is the most preposterous thing I've ever if heard If you'd of. talked to me on the phone last night, I wouldn't have come here. But I'm curious to know what you want of my husband after you threw him in the gutter for a richer man. 
Would you mind telling me? Well, I'll have to go, I'm afraid. If you do, my dear, I'll put this grapefruit smack in your face. <laughs> you know, I'm awfully sorry I had to say that to you, but you're not smart enough to talk to me, and so I've got to make you. You know, when you got through with Jeff, he was ready to jump in the river. You'd probably have felt flattered if he had. Well, I put him on his feet again. Now, is there any reason why you can't leave him alone? <laughs> Perhaps he feels he belongs amongst his own kind of people, my dear. When Jeff feels that way, he can go, and he knows it. But I don't intend to have him stolen from me, and especially by you. You haven't the slightest idea of what you're talking about. Oh, yes, I have. He wouldn't have gone near you of his own accord. You looked him up, and then you played on his sympathy. Why, you miserable little street You need his help, do you? Because that good-natured husband of yours, whose money you're spending, abuses you? Why, you horrid little blackmailing... You wouldn't like to draw grapefruit, would you? Oh, 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 oh. You miss me, darling. You know, sometimes I do that, but I have a much better aim. Good afternoon, ladies. Read all about it. Faith, bar, society, women, and battle. This is Lenity Marlin. Stage is free for all at the Waldorf. Paper. Society woman hoils the grapefruit. She hoils the grapefruit. Here you are, Oh, hello, Jeff. Hello. I suppose you've seen the paper. Why, yes, I have. Society women hurl grapefruit on the Waldorf grill. <laughs> Very nice. She made an awful fool of herself. But I'm sorry it had to get in the papers. Yes. Yeah. It's too bad you had to do it, Miriam. Me? Say, I didn't throw that grapefruit. Well, does it make any difference? What do you mean, does it make any difference? Well, you went there to make a scene, didn't you? I went there to ask her to leave my husband alone. Well, you certainly picked a fine place. Oh, I suppose I had no right in the Waldorf. Well... I want you to know that I conducted myself just as proper as anybody there. Well, look at that headline. Society women battle, and that includes me. They took me for a society woman, too. Say, she's the one that made a fool of herself. You can ask Mrs. Martin. I never even once raised my voice, and I... Oh. Oh, I suppose you've been talking it over with her. Yes, I have. Well, aren't you going to hear my side of it? I think you ought to before you get sore. I'm not sore, Miriam. I've thought this thing over very carefully. Yeah, yeah, with her. Well, I can't see that that matters. You talked me over with her as if I was some sort of a freak in a sideshow. Well, how about talking her over with me? I might give you a few tips, too. No, but I'm in the wrong class, even if I don't sling grapefruit at people in public. Do you think that's fair, Jeff? Why don't you hear my side of it? I do, Miriam. I'm not blaming you for what happened this afternoon. I only wanted to ask her to leave you alone. Because I love you so much and... You are mine in a way. I'm trying to tell you that I blame myself for everything. I did a very cruel thing in ever letting you come into this bargain. My mind was numb or I would have sent you away that morning. Yeah, and finished up in the morgue. To save hurting you like this, I wish I had. Oh. So, so you're through with me, huh? Oh, don't put it that way. We both knew it had to come sometime. I, I guess I forgot. Miriam, there's no other way out for either of us. We're too far apart in every way. You let me go on loving you more and more. Yes, I know. I couldn't bring myself to hurt you. I have a very deep affection for you, and, and I always will have. But six months or a year from now, you'll realize that this is the thing to do. Of course, you'll always be provided for, but... But even with that, I know that I can never repay you. I'm terribly sorry. I'm going over to the club for the time being. Oh, you'll move out to the club like the perfect gentleman. Well, why don't you throw me out tonight? Out in the street where you pick me up. Miriam, please. No, your kind don't do it that way. Your kind ditch your women with dignity, don't you? You leave her the apartment with a check on the dresser, move out to the club. Now, Miriam. Well, you're not going to walk out of me. I'm going to spoil your act. Now, listen, will you? No, I won't listen. That's all I've done since I met you is listen to your hooey. And now I ate it up and for what? So as maybe I get to be taken out to the Waldorf for lunch. To make myself fit to a, with a cut-rate gigolo like you. And that's what you are at heart, a gigolo. You don't take money from women, but you take something better. Something you haven't got, and that's nerve. Why, you can't even stand on your own feet. The minute a woman steps out from under you, you flop in the mud, and you lay there till another woman comes along and picks you up. And that's what I did. I guess I was lonely, and I wanted a little love. I thought you wanted love, too. But you don't know what that means. And now that you're the big, strong, stuffed shirt again, the vulgar little fool who helped you out my cramp your style... He's embarrassed at the way she holds her fork, and so he's taking his top and his dress suit, and he's moving out of the club. Well, get this. You're not walking out on me. No heel in the world can do that, because I'm walking out on you. Miriam! (laughs) 
Well, I don't know, Mr. Sherwood. Right now, she's packing her grip. <laughs> well, I'll ask her. It's Jeffrey on the phone. He's at the club. He wants to speak to you. No. You really ought to, you know. It, it's only fair. I said no. I don't want to talk with him. All right, you little idiot. Hello, Mr. Sherwood. She won't talk to you. Reason? <laughs> well, I've reasoned with her till I'm blue in the face, but it's no use. Personally, Mr. Sherwood, I think you spoke your little piece at the wrong time. Good night. Poor boy. He sounded as if he might be drinking. Yeah? Well, she could nurse him out of it this time. On grapefruit juice. Well, for heaven's sake, Jeffrey, sit down. Hold your chin up, darling. What's the matter with you? Oh, I've been trying to reach her all night. She won't even speak to me. Well, I think that settles the whole thing beautifully, don't you? As a matter of fact, I don't see what you have to speak to her about anyway. What did you want to speak to her about? What? Oh, well, I don't know. I, I just wanted to speak to her, that's all. After all, I... Well, I, I do owe her something, you know. Do you? Well, pay her off, darling, and consider yourself well out of it. I'm sorry, Valentine, but it's not quite as casual as that. We're married. Maybe you don't think that's very important. Well, you needn't raise your voice, Jeffrey. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, darling, what's the matter with us? Why are you letting this thing annoy us? <laughs> Come here. We're going to be happy, Jeffrey. After all this mix-up, things are going to straighten out at last. <laughs> She'll get a divorce, and John's going to give me one. He's coming here this evening. He's, uh, what for? Well, talk things over. We have to make a few arrangements. Well, did you tell him I was going to be here? Of course not. Why should I? Well, you knew I was going to be here. Oh, oh darling, don't be so naive. <laughs> Poor John, you know, I feel rather sorry for him. <laughs> But it's rather amusing as a situation, I mean. Yeah, well, Valentine, I don't like this. Why not? Well, because it isn't fair to your husband. John Marlin's in love with you, whether you like it or not. I don't see any reason for rubbing his nose in the dust. Well, I think I know how to handle my affairs, Jeffrey. Well, that still doesn't justify the... I'm not in love with my husband. We're making plans to separate. It's no different from what you're doing from that street gammon. It's all the difference in the world. And don't call her a street gammon. Are you defending her? Yes, I am. You sound as if you're in love with well, her. Well, I am. What? Uh, well, I said it, didn't I? I mean, you heard me, didn't you? And, uh, I mean, I didn't know... Well, I am in love with her. Oh, all right, then. Go back to her, and I hope she throws you out again. Well, thanks. I'm getting used to it by now. Oh. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, Sherwood. Hello, Marlon. Are you in love with your wife? Why, yes. Sorry, old man. Goodbye. <laughs> Valentine. What? Oh, what John. Is he... <laughs> Valentine, look at me. Oh, John, darling. <laughs> Who's out there? Who is it? Shh. It's, it's, it's I, Mrs. Martin. I'm, I'm out here in the hall. Why, Mr. Sher... What in the world are you doing sitting on the floor? It's five o'clock in the morning. Uh, wouldn't you know about that? Oh, sure, sure. I know it. Uh, I, I was just waiting for Miriam to open the door to get the milk. Then I'm going to force my way in. Well, you're too late. She spent last night at a hotel. She's catching the morning train for Reno. Reno? She can't. Great Lakes Limited leaving on track four. Great Lakes Limited. Here you are, miss. On to Chicago and straight through to Reno. Thank you. You better hurry, miss. Great Lakes Limited. Here, quick, Limited. give me a ticket. Yes, sir. Where are you? Chicago, Reno, Great Lakes Limited. Limited. Sorry, sir, but you're too late. The gate's just closed. It's what? Take the next train, sir? Yeah. No. Uh, forget it. The Albany Special leaving on track six. Grip, miss? Yes. Hotel Reno, please. And where can I send a wire? Uh, right over there, miss. Thanks. I want to send a wire, please. Yes, ma'am? It's going to Mrs. Henry J. Martin, 411 West 8th Street, New York. Arrive, Reno. We'll write tonight. Have you... Have you seen Jeff? Yes, and he's looking splendid. <gasps> Why, Jeffrey? Hello, Miriam. Well, 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 how did you get here? I flew. I've been waiting for well, you. Well, what for? Oh, just to say hello. Well, hello, now goodbye. Yeah, well, I've got a more, lot more than that to say. I've but, got so much to say, it'll take the whole trip back. But say. I'm not going back. Oh, now, Miriam, look, you can't do this to me. But, I, I need you, Miriam. But you've got Valentine now, Jeff, and I... Yeah, but I haven't. 
Oh, I suppose she threw you over, huh? Huh? Yeah, huh? that's it. Yeah, that, that, she, she walked out on me yeah. again. Gone back to her husband. Oh, it's awful. I don't know which way to turn, Mary. It's awful. Yes, it is. Yeah. Oh, poor Jeff. Yeah, now, no, no, you know, you helped me once. Yeah. You, you've got to help me again, or yeah. I'll go right into the gutter if you don't. Now, say you'll help oh, me. Oh, yes, yes, I'll help you. Oh, darling, you're such a terrible liar, but I'll help you. Oh, Mary, <gasps> oh, darling. <laughs> We say goodbye to the girl from 10th Avenue and raise our curtain once again to bring back Loretta Young and George Brandt as themselves. Both our stars left studio sound stages to be with us this week. Miss Young is playing the Empress Eugenie in Suez for 20th Century Fox, and Mr. Brandt is starring in Racket Busters for Warner Brothers. Come to think of it, Loretta, isn't, uh, isn't Suez your first historical costume picture since the Crusades? Uh, yes, I believe it is. And uh, your mention of the Crusades brings back that episode you touched on earlier tonight when I uh, held up your picture for several weeks. Mm. If you remember, all I said, or rather all you said when I finally arrived was, I don't know whether to kiss you or kill you. <laughs> Have you made up your mind yet? Hmm. You're, you're still very much alive, Loretta. <laughs> and as for the other threat, well, it... It might be kind of rough for you, my lady. Oh, I see you still remember that famous line from the Crusades. Well, what's so famous about that? In the picture, Loretta was keeping a midnight vigil on a battlefield when a sentry put his cloak around her saying, it's kind of rough for you, my lady. He was probably right. <laughs> well, his, his intentions were. But kind of hardly fitted the 12th century. We didn't mind it so much in America, but when we showed the film in England, that speech brought such a laugh we had to cut it out. They tell me the English have adopted the phrase as a slang expression. And rapidly switching the subject, George, tell us, uh, how are you and the airplanes doing these days? Well, we've practically severed relations, Mr. DeMille. I, I haven't done any flying in months. Seems the studio would much prefer to see Brent on the ground. <laughs> but I'm glad you brought up the topic because it gives me a chance to say a word on behalf of Airmail Week. Oh, uh, Go ahead. A uh, word very appropriate, George, right now. Well, yesterday was the 20th anniversary of the first airmail route in the world. It ran between New York, Philadelphia, and Washington. And during the next five days, the country is observing National Airmail Week. And so for the post office department, I'm glad to remind all our listeners that the remarkable developments in the airmail service today place the whole country in what might be called one postal neighborhood. Now, for three cents more, the 3,000 miles across the continent are reduced to almost a local route. And I think that's a pretty remarkable achievement. And we can't say too much for the men who made it possible. <laughs> and while we're in the boosty mood, Mr. DeMille, I'd like to say something about another national institution, Lux Soap. It's a grand complexion care and one that I use every day when I'm at the studio and at home. There's nothing fine, in my opinion, for a fresh, smooth complexion. I've enjoyed being here tonight tremendously. And to you, Mr. DeMille, and all of our listeners... My thanks, and good night. Good night, C.B. Good night, Loretta. Good night, Loretta. We, we steer our course next Monday night toward the rising sun, to Singapore, that distant island lying off the tip of the Malay Peninsula. Against this exotic background, in a land of steaming jungle and riotous color, our play is set. Backed by a distinguished record on stage and screen, its title is The Letter. Its author, W. Somerset Maugham. And starring in The Letter, making her first appearance since her return from England, you'll hear that beautiful and brilliant actress, Merle Oberon. And co-starred, Walter Brennan, Ralph Forbes, and Nigel Bruce. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Merle Oberon, Walter Houston, Ralph Forbes, and Nigel Bruce in the letter. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Louis Silver is appeared for courtesy of 20th Century Fox Studios, where he directed music for the new Jane Weathers film, Rascals. Heard during tonight's performance was High Hole from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.